Data augmentation is one of the most popular techniques to prevent overfitting when trying to use deep learning with small labeled data sets. For example, if you only have a thousand labeled examples, it's unlikely that deep learning will work well. Data augmentation is a great solution to this, where we apply transformations to the data to artificially increase the size of it. However, this only really works for images. With images, it's easy to define transformations like rotations, horizontal flips, or brightness modifications that preserve the semantic label of the instance. If you rotate a cat, it's still going to be labeled as a cat. However, it's not so easy to define label-preserving transformations in domains like healthcare data or text. In text, we could apply an augmentation like random swapping or deletion, but we could easily take away a word that was essential to the label of the text sequence. In this research published in ICLR 2021, the authors present a technique for augmenting data in the intermediate feature space that improves on all baselines of modality agnostic data augmentation. This video will explain the ideas in the research, such as the four augmentation strategies in the latent space, the three loss functions used to structure this latent space, and the use of population-based augmentation to control the hyperparameters of applying these techniques. I'm really excited about this research to expand data augmentation and make it more generally useful. This video will present Modals, Modality Agnostic Automated Data Augmentation in the Latent Space, published in the ICLR 2021 conference. As a quick introduction, if you're completely unfamiliar with data augmentation, deep learning generally does not work well with small data sets. If you only have a thousand labeled examples or say even 2000 or 5000, it's unlikely that fitting a highly parametric deep neural network is gonna work well on this task. So a popular solution is to construct artificial examples from the examples we already have to prevent this overfitting on the small data set, and this is known as data augmentation. So this strategy of constructing artificial examples relies on prior knowledge about the data domain, and it primarily works for images because it's easy to define these label-preserving transformations on images compared to other domains like text, uh, sensor data, heart rate data, all this kind of data, it's much harder to define these guaranteed to be label preserving transformations. So for example, we have this uh, flower image with the semantic category of the label is flower, and we can rotate it, we can translate it, we can increase or decrease the brightness, and it, not, it never turns the flower into a dog or a, some other object category, or even kind of threatens the label at all. So it's really safe to apply these data augmentation transformations to images, but less so for other data. And that's the motivation behind this paper is how can we apply data augmentation to data domains outside of images like discrete data and text data. To continue on this idea, it's hard to define label preserving transformations for text. This is the most popular uh, kind of off the shelf baseline technique for data augmentation in text data. Easy Data Augmentation Techniques for Boosting Performance on Text Classification Tasks is the name of the paper, and it introduces four different data augmentations. Synonym Replacement, Random Insertion, Random Swapping, and Random Deletion. You can see how it's easy, easy to uh, swipe out these words, randomly insert words, or swap them out and delete them, such that you've changed the label of the original text classification task. And also, say you have tasks like question answering, like the squad benchmark, you could delete the answer, you could insert another kind of misleading answer. This is kind of a noisy way of applying data augmentation compared to the image data augmentations, which are very guaranteed to preserve the label compared to these kind of text augmentations. The motivation of this paper, Modal's Modality Agnostic Automated Data Augmentation in the Latent Space, is how can we use data augmentation for other domains such as text, maybe healthcare data like the physiological ICU data in the Mimic 3 data set, robotic sensors, or time series data. We want to be able to apply these transformations to amplify our data set and avoid overfitting and have this data space regularization, but it's harder to come up with these transformations that preserve the label. So we want to look to what we can do with the latent space, the feature space, in order to define these data augmentation transformations. The idea is to augment the data in the latent space rather than the input space. So what this means is just looking at this quick model that summary of a convolutional neural network, we have these intermediate sequential processing of these features. We call these intermediate layers the latent space or the feature space, and we say augment this dense vector at the end of the model compared to augmenting the image right at the input layer or maybe even earlier on in the model. So we're talking about trying to do some kind of augmentation with these representation vectors from any kind of data domain. This could be, again, the healthcare data, text data, any kind of data can be augmented in this latent space as every deep neural network has this architecture of going through several layers of sequential processing and feature transformation. This video from Robert Luxemburg, linked in the description of this video, is a great example of this idea of latent space interpolation.
This is the style GAN to latent space and walking along these vectors that produce these images. In the generative adversarial network architecture, you start off with a random noise vector that gets passed through this generator that upsamples it into an image. And in the GAN framework, you're able to look at those original input vectors, the Z randomly sampled vectors, and you can uh, say average two different vectors that produce two different face images to then generate the average of the two facial images that will be rendered. And you can have like even intervals walking along the uh, difference between the two uh, source vectors to get this kind of transition into the two images. And the StyleGAN2 is an example of just a really interesting latent space, probably the, the most interesting latent space kind of interpolation idea that exists out there. So we're trying to target this idea of having this semantic latent space, but not with images, with all kinds of data, and not necessarily learn through generative models, but learn through uh, classification models. Before diving deeper into the new ideas in modals, this idea has been proposed previously, and this is a paper in ICLR 2017 on dataset augmentation in the feature space. The key distinction here is going to be the definition of how we traverse the latent space and then the use of an autoencoder. Personally, it also seems the most intuitive when you're experimenting with this idea of augmenting data in the feature space to define some kind of autoencoder where you say map an image down into the latent space and then back into the image and then walk along this latent space because having that decoder half really lets you see what's happening as you're transforming the feature vector. But in this case, we're going to be augmenting the data with a classifier. And again, before getting deeper into the details of the modal's algorithm, here are some other strategies for generalizable data augmentation or modality agnostic data augmentation. So the cutout technique is that basically drop out in the input space. This is where you would apply some kind of mask. This is shown in images, but you could apply this to any kind of data where you either just zero out a window in your data, or you could apply random noise or a constant value or so on. Cut mix is similar to cut out, except you replace this cropped out thing with another uh, data point. So say you crop out this patch of the car, and then you put in this patch from the deer image into that patch to construct the augmented example. Mix up is where you uh, really just take two instances from your data set and you just average them together and you might average together the label vectors as well. And then another interesting idea is to try to learn the distribution of your data set with a generative model, like maybe a generative adversarial network or an autoregressive model. There's all kinds of uh, generative models like um, maybe normalizing flows or the autoencoders we mentioned previously, but you try to learn the data distribution with a generative model and then maybe you try to sample data from that generative model and append that data as data augmentation. That's similar to this idea of using the autoencoder, except for this idea has this uh, feature space kind of uh, mix up thing. So mix up uh, this idea previously, data set augmentation and feature space is like the combination of the generative model and then mix up where you have these two latent vectors and you just average them together to produce a new one. So now let's dive into the details of the modals algorithm. So the authors define two core challenges for defining augmentations in this latent space. The first of which is learning a latent space that's continuous for transformation. So we saw this example of uh, Robert Luxemburg's video animating the style GAN transformations. And we see how it's this smooth transformation from image to image when you're going between two different facial images and walking along the latent space that renders the resulting facial image. But you might have a latent space that isn't continuous and say you add some uh, dimension to the Z vector and then all of a sudden the image has changed dramatically. That's one of the big uh, adjustments to the StyleGAN version 2 architecture is having this path length regularization that makes it so as you walk along the uh, latent space, you don't have sharp changes in the resulting generated image. So we need to have a smooth latent space for these kinds of transformations to make sure we don't change it too dramatically at any uh, step. And then we want to find the effective directions to traverse. So now that we have this latent space that represents our data set, how exactly are we supposed to be uh, augmenting the data in this space? Should we just be, say, averaging them together like mix-up, or can we find some more clever ways of doing this, which they do present in the paper? To achieve these goals, the authors are going to introduce some latent space traversal strategies, model structure with three losses to structure this continuous latent space, and then they're going to learn the optimal configuration with the population-based augmentation, the PBA controller algorithm, compared to something like auto augment or these other kinds of uh, hyperparameter control algorithm. We'll begin the technical discussion with the latent space traversal strategies. So imagine we have this um, triangle is our original data point that we're trying to construct an augmented example from. We've gotten to this latent space vector by taking our original input instance, whether this is some kind of set of healthcare data, time series data, or sensor data, or text data, and we've encoded it into the hidden representational vector. And that's now what our triangle in this diagram represents. So this circle is meant to denote the class boundaries. 
So say our data is labeled into, say it's just IMDB text classification, an easy example, and we have labels like positive and negative sentiment. We draw this circle, obviously it would be a much more complicated shape than a circle, but we draw this circle around our uh, points that are under the category of positive. So the idea of hard example interpolation is to look for a point that's on the edge of this boundary. We have in the middle, we have the, uh, the mean, like if you do something like K means with these representational vectors all belonging to the same class, that would represent the center of the circle. So we have the center of the circle is the mean representation for a given class label like positive or negative sentiment or you know whatever kind of text classification task just to illustrate this concept. Maybe it's uh, like question topic classification or intent classification like a chatbot uses. But we have this center uh, representational vector that represents the easiest example, say, and then we have on the border the hardest examples. So hard example interpolation means moving this vector of our triangle towards one of the harder examples that lie on the boundary of, this, uh, of the representations for this class label. The next idea is hard example extrapolation. So this is where we really just uh, take the direction because we have these vectors and we can compute the uh, direction distance because they're a measure of uh, direction as well as magnitude. And we compute the direction and we just kind of add in this direction to increase it, to push it away from the direction of the center of the class label representations. So the other two ideas are pretty straightforward. Uh, C is the idea of adding Gaussian noise to the representation vector, just sampling a Gaussian noise vector and then just adding it to it. And then D is the difference idea. So D would re refer to taking two other points in this representation space for the same class label, computing their distance directionally, similarly to this, and then moving this given triangle in that direction. So this is the idea of the difference transform, Gaussian noise, hard example extrapolation going out of the class, and then hard example interpolation, pushing this to one of the harder examples on the boundary of the class, but not necessarily just towards the direction of outside of the class. Maybe these equations will help cement this idea further for you. I don't really think it adds too much value, but the idea of hard example interpolation, you have S, which is one of these points, and then you have the difference, then the lambda is the weighting of how much we're gonna shift it towards this point. Uh, extrapolation, same exact idea, except from the mean, and then lambda two, weighting how much you're pushing it away from the mean. Gaussian noise, this epsilon representing a randomly sampled Gaussian noise vector, and then pushing it uh, around by adding this Gaussian noise. And then difference transform, you take two different points, Z, Z sub J and Z sub K, subtract their difference and then push this based on that difference. So this is just more concrete explanations of these different ideas. Next we'll return to the idea of learning a latent space that has continuous transformations. And we're gonna do this by introducing three different loss functions. We have our classification loss, we have a uh, generative adversarial network style adversarial loss, and then we have a triplet loss. So again, this idea is based on this idea of learning a latent space that's continuous for transformation and making sure when we walk along this uh, interpolation, extrapolation, adding the noise or different transformations, we wanna make sure that we don't accidentally have some sharp transformation in the latent space as we kind of push along these intermediate feature vectors. So the way we're gonna do this is with this extra structure to the loss function. So you can see the high level of the system architecture before we dive into the individual loss functions. We have our individual, or we have our input data instance X. This could be an image, it could be text, it could be healthcare data and so on. And then we pass it through our deep neural network and we end up with this representation vector Z in one of the intermediate layers of our neural network. So this intermediate vector Z is gonna be passed into a triplet uh, loss as well as an adversarial loss. And then we're also going to pass it into the data augmentation transformation. This is gonna be where we actually apply this augmentation, whether it's you know one of these four augmentations that we've just defined, is gonna be controlled with a policy. The policy is gonna be this population-based augmentation thing, but don't worry about this yet. And it's only tested in the paper on the image experiment so far, but it is a very interesting idea and we'll explain it at the end of this video. But once you transform it, you end up with Z prime, this augmented uh, latent space vector. And then this is what gets passed into the classification layer. So we have these three loss functions to try to smoothen out this latent space with adversarial losses and a triple triplet loss. And then we also have the augmented data point getting passed into our classification layer. So we're not learning an autoencoder. This is different from uh, say the previous paper in 2017, where we have this autoencoder to try to augment these examples, which has a nice property where we get to see what it ends up looking like, say if it's an image or text, it's easy to visualize the output of the transformation. But in this case, we are just passing this into our classification layer. Taking apart these loss functions, we have a classification loss, an adversarial loss, and a loss and a loss. Classification loss is pretty straightforward. We have our parameterization of our classifier, this last dense layer. Uh, parameterized by theta. We have this uh, distribution over the logits where you basically have this exponential by the, the logit of the 
individual class label and then the sum of all the other densities it put on all the other class labels. This is the pretty standard uh, softmax loss function used for classification losses. The idea behind the adversarial loss is to try to make this uh, distribution of these latent vectors close to the normal distribution by having this discriminator try to tell if it came from this feature extractor or if it was sampled from the Gaussian distribution. So we have an adversarial loss, it's classifying whether the Z vectors, a batch of these Z vectors was produced from the generator or the feature extractor or sampled from random noise. So the idea here is that if these uh, latent space Z vectors are indistinguishable from uh, Gaussian noise, then it's gonna have this smooth latent space of the Gaussian uh, distribution. So you're trying to push it towards this Gaussian distribution and normalize it. This is kind of similar to these ideas of uh, variational autoencoders also have a technique where you're regularizing the prior of the distribution of these latent variables. So it's a very similar idea to that, just explicitly using this discriminator, rather than say a KL divergence between these two distributions, you're training a classifier or discriminator to do this distinction, again, compared to just taking the, the difference between these two probability distributions. The final loss we apply is the triplet loss. This is really similar to what's used in contrastive learning. This is the more foundational work, the metric learning work, and the triplet loss is used to push representations between an anchor and a positive and an anchor and a negative. So in this case, we're putting two different data points also through our feature extractor. Say we have a, a cat image, another cat image, and then a dog image, and then we're gonna push the representations of the cat and the other cat towards each other, and the cat and the dog to be away from each other. And then particularly with this uh, triplet loss structure, we have this uh, gamma margin parameter. So it's not just enough for them to be different, we control exactly how different they should be with respect to these two distance metrics. It could be something like L1 or L2 distance, and then we also add this margin to further penalize it if it's not uh, far enough away from each other. So this is adding additional structure. In my opinion, it's very similar to the classification loss. And if you read papers like supervised contrastive learning, they bridge this kind of idea between contrastive learning and then say like cross entropy loss functions between these logits. But the idea is you're adding even more structure with this triplet loss to try to really achieve this idea of hard example interpolation, hard example extrapolation, and try to make these boundaries defined as well as possible. To put together all the ideas presented so far in modals, we have four different strategies for defining these augmentations in the latent space, the hard example interpolation, hard example extrapolation, adding Gaussian noise to the latent vector, and then difference transforms. And we also have these three loss functions to structure and learn this latent space, classification, adversarial, and triplet losses. Here are the results of applying modals on two different text classification tasks. The SST2 task is about sentiment classification, and then the Trek challenge is a question topic classification. So we see the comparison without using any data augmentation, the easy data augmentations like random insertion, random deletion, random swapping, and synonym replacement, sentence mixup where we're gonna uh, just randomly concatenate or randomly um, average out two of these text sequences together, and then we're also gonna average out the label and do that kind of augmentation, back translation, and then these are two different back translation models depending on which language we're going uh, to and from. So we see that modals performs better than all these other data augmentation schemes, uh, performs much better in this first uh, split of the SST2 data set, and then compared to no augmentation, we see huge gains on all of these uh, different strategies. But we do see promising results from modals, and that's kind of the most interesting thing that we're after with this. And I think there still even is more opportunity for modals as well as these other things because they probably can be stacked together and learn curriculums, and that's kind of the idea of the population-based augmentation thing that they're gonna get into later with their experimentations on image data. So they also show the results on uh, these tabular data sets, the iris flower uh, classification, uh, features that denote this breast cancer classification and this other data set, and then uh, some time series data sets as well. And you see again the modals uh, data set performing well compared to, uh, in this case, performing really well compared to some other techniques like mix up and then also just no augmentation. Finally, before transitioning to the comparison with image data and bringing in the population-based augmentation controller, here are two more comparisons with tabular datasets where the features are defined with heuristically crafted features that describe instances in the dataset, and it's really hard to define data augmentations for this kind of data, which is why we're so interested in modals and why we compare it with other modality agnostic techniques like mix-up, cut-out, and uh, cut-mix, or this uh, generative sampling idea. To introduce this idea of the population-based augmentation controller of the hyperparameters of these data augmentations, the question is, how should we sample from these transformations? We have these four different transformations to apply to our data. How often should we do each one with each batch of data? What should this lambda parameter be that controls the strength of this transformation? And these hyperparameters of how often to apply these operations, chain them together in sequence, is the focus of papers like 
Otto Augment, Rand Augment. There's a massive uh, body of research that's looking at controlling the hyperparameters of these data augmentation transformations. So in this case, we're going to introduce the use of population-based augmentation and see how well this uh, improves on controlling how often to apply each of these transformations and in these lambda magnitude parameters. Trying to find controllers for the hyperparameters of data augmentation is an active body of research, and in 2018, Auto Augment was published that dramatically improved the performance on models like ImageNet classification and all these image classification uh, datasets. This one shown here is the Street View House Numbers dataset, SVHN, and these are the different policies that are produced by this controller. So the controller has these uh, different ways of sampling the frequency, the probability of applying an augmentation like shear X or invert or auto contrast, these kind of transformations to image data. It has a probability of applying the operation and then a hyperparameter that controls the magnitude of it. So if we're rotating it, how much should we rotate it? A little bit or a lot? And then we also have the same kind of idea with our uh, defined latent space operations. Should we really heavily move along the border of the class? Should we really be pushed outside of the class? How strong should this Gaussian noise be? And so on. So we have an understanding of this magnitude parameter. And this kind of search for this curriculum has been really successful in improving these models. The core distinction between auto-augment and population-based augmentation is the search strategy for finding this policy. Auto-augment trains a recurrent neural network controller that's trained with proximal policy optimization and reinforcement learning as it learns to sample a curriculum of these hyperparameters and then is evaluated with the sparse reward of how well the resulting image classification model performs. Population-based augmentation is rather the idea of having a population of these hyperparameters and then evolving them over time and then having the fitness function, mutation, and doing this in one forward pass. So the idea is that at the end of a population-based augmentation, you don't need to retrain a model from scratch. It kind of trains a model in the forward pass of the hyperparameter controller search as well. So again, this idea of population-based training, we have a population, say uh, 16 different configurations of hyperparameters are in our population. We're all rolling that out sequentially to train these neural networks. And then we're gonna have this fitness function where we uh, choose which ones to crush, like this one that's not performing well, and then we'll do some kind of uh, mutation or crossover or something like that. And then we end up with a train model in the forward pass of our controller search algorithm as well. We see a significant improvement by applying population-based augmentation to control the hyperparameters of our modal's data augmentation scheme. Particularly, these gains are in the reduced uh, settings of CIFAR-10 and Street View house numbers compared to the full data set where we see a very small gain. And this is common because data augmentation is a technique designed for learning from small label data sets compared to the 50,000 images in CIFAR-10. So it's common to see these reduced data sets to illustrate these concepts in these papers that are trying to use these academic data sets like CIFAR-10, but still evaluating it on this subset of the problem where we're trying to learn from few labeled examples, the original motivation of our investigation to data augmentation. Finally, the authors conclude with ablations of the impact of the loss functions showing the benefits from not only just applying the classification loss, but also applying the adversarial loss as well as the triplet loss and then all three together, dramatically improving the performance about 3% compared to only using the classification loss. So then we see the other ablation between the hard interpolation and extrapolation. This is referring to whether you're looking for a point on the uh, border of the uh, class boundary to make this transformation. I'm really excited about this advancement in modality agnostic data augmentation. For example, we have these Kaggle competitions where we have uh, data science modeling competitions outside of just image and text data. We have things like this mechanisms of action prediction task where it's hard to define these data augmentations that would improve performance. So I really hope this modalis technique, maybe using other things like the cutout cut mix and mix up as well as the generative augmentation can improve performance on other kinds of data domains outside of just images and then text. Another recent breakthrough in deep learning has been the success of contrastive self-supervised learning. This is where we can take massive amounts of unlabeled data and use useful representations by exploiting positive pairs constructed through data augmentations. So having this technique of constructing augmentations in the latent space may help us unlock contrastive learning for domains outside of images. Finally, I want to present some pretty ambitious ideas for data augmentation that could maybe be modality agnostic as well. So we've seen a boom in teacher-student learning with things like model agnostic meta-learning MAML. This is where we have an outer inner loop and we apply gradients from a teacher through the student network's learning process. So we have uh, two derivatives of this uh, inner outer loop propagation of the gradients. And we have papers like teaching with commentaries from Jeff Hinton, uh, meta pseudo labels, and then we also have some really exciting papers that I like, generative teaching networks, view maker networks, and the use of how they apply these normalizing flow transformations in the paper, what makes for uh, good views and contrastive learning.
To illustrate this difference, compared to where we had the population-based controller that's controlling the hyperparameters of these augmentations, things like outer inner loop gradients directly apply gradient descent learning from the outer loop to the inner loop. And this is a really great paper that I highly recommend checking out. The Generative Teaching Networks paper tries to produce an image data set that results in faster learning compared to the real uh, MNIST data set. And this is the resulting data set that it produces. So this is kind of something like a, a latent space transformation. We see how uh, these images they don't look like they're like natural images and they're confusing, but they do produce better classifiers for evaluated on the MNIST test set. So here's kind of another idea of how to control these kind of augmentations that I think could be extended to be modality agnostic as well. And it could directly be controlling, it could either directly generate data such as directly generating these latent space vectors that are then uh, fed into the classifier in the last part of our model architecture it could just g directly generate these latent vectors and a smaller set of these similar to the generative teaching networks framework. So I think just presenting this is another way of maybe thinking about this problem of defining modality agnostic data augmentation. Thanks for watching this explanation of modals, modality agnostic automated data augmentation in the latent space. I'm really excited about learning how to apply data augmentation outside of just images where it's easy to define these label preserving transformations and see how this idea of data augmentation can be made more general. And I think really just the idea of the data that's used to train the deep neural networks is such an interesting part. And in my opinion, the most important part of this pipeline of training these machine learning models. And I think the data part of it is, you know, maybe a little overlooked and data augmentation to me is one of the most interesting research areas of deep learning. So thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please subscribe to Henry AI Labs for more deep learning and AI videos.